Lord, protect me today. Let me be an example. Let me be a leader. Bless me with your righteousness. Let them see you in me. God, I need you right now. Help me out of this mess. Help me take a stand against the devil. Help me stand my ground. Please lead me away from this temptation. Deliver me from this evil. I could have died. Thank you for watching out for me. My life is in your hands. Jesus, you are Lord of my life. Jesus, your word says, I can have whatever I pray in your name. Your word says, the power that raised you from the dead lives in me. Heal me, God. Save me from the grip of death. I have faith that your mighty hand can move this mountain. Your servant is ready for battle. With Christ, we have the victory. You are if you know Jesus. Man, let me encourage you guys. Uh, man, I, I just want you to leave your stress at the door for a moment. Whatever it is you guys walked in with today, I just want you to leave it there. And I want you to just open your hearts and minds to what God wants to deposit into your life. Because there is a very real enemy who wants to steal every seed God has ever sown. And the truth is, if we guard that seed, right, with our minds, man, that seed is going to birth in our hearts. And part of that is a decision, right, where we have to choose not to dwell in the past and our guilt and our shame and all the things that the enemy uses to attack your life. And uh, we are in part six of our message series entitled SWAT, which stands for Spiritual Warfare and Tactics. So if you're uh, here for the first time today uh, in person online podcast, uh, you want to go back to our library, you can go through our website or our app to listen to those past messages to bring you up to speed. And we're working through Ephesians 6, which Paul is writing uh, to the church at Ephesus, and he's writing to wake up a church. Now he's writing from uh, home prison, right? He's literally under house arrest in Rome, and he's writing a letter to wake up the church, you and I, and he's saying, guys, there's a spiritual war going on. There's a battle, and there's a very real enemy, the devil, who, man, he prowls around like a lion looking to uh, kill, to steal, to destroy, and he wants to wreak havoc in your life. And so many of us, even as followers of Christ, or, or maybe you're not, maybe you're walking into the service today, and you're like, I don't really know what I believe about God, and what Paul is trying to do is to wake you up to recognize that, man, a lot of these battles that are going on in your life, man, it, it, it's, it might not be you. It may not be the person next to you. It might not be your circumstances. It actually might be a very real enemy in your life. And, and this week, I can give a, a story to that, um, and I was able to recognize it so quickly because of this message series. Man, this week, uh, probably it was, I think, Monday or Tuesday, I woke up. How many of you know what it's like to wake up on the wrong side of the bed? Did you ever do that? Like I woke up at the wrong side and I wanted to roll over and come out the other way, but I just didn't do it. And I woke up and I was just frustrated. I don't know what it was. Everything seemed negative to me. It's like no matter what was happening in my day, it was going through a filter of negativity and coming out on the other side is not good enough, wasn't measuring up. I was thinking about everything you could imagine and everything really stunk. Now, what's interesting is that's not me by nature. By nature, I'm an optimistic person. By nature, man, I'm a big faith person, trusting the sovereignty of God. I mean, I've been through a lot of things that kind of developed me into that person. But generally, I'm an optimist. Glasses half full. I'm waiting for God to do something big and amazing and use a hard situation in my life for some good, and I'm going to get to see that. But it wasn't true this morning of me. That morning I woke up, it was all negative, and I didn't catch it right away, and I started feeding it, and I started thinking about why I was feeling that way, and every time a negative thought hit me, I would allow it to take me places. You ever allow your thoughts to take you places? So I did that, and then probably about an hour or two in, I just felt the presence of the Spirit on me, and it reminded me of this message series, and I thought, wait a minute, could this be? Could this be that moment that I'm being attacked spiritually? So you know what I did? I, I prayed. I sought God. I got on my knees. I said, God, what's going on? And then I started to rebuke the enemy and his work in my life in the name of Jesus. And it sounded just like that. It was, Satan, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I am not in alignment. Guys, pay attention to this. This is how I did war, spiritual warfare. I'm not in agreement with that negative thinking. I'm not in agreement with those negative filters. I'm not in agreement with what I'm thinking about this situation or that one. Let me claim something true. This is what I 
believe God is doing. And I spoke truth, and you know what happened? It lifted. It literally lifted. I was going through spiritual warfare on a Monday or a Tuesday morning, and what is the enemy's attempt? It's to jam me up and you. If you're a follower of Jesus, his goal is to distract you. But why distract you? Because you're dangerous. You're dangerous to the army of the enemy, to the work of the enemy, because within the mouth, the heart, and the hands of every believer is acts of love and kindness, being the hands and feet of Jesus. And even more important than just acts of love, it's the word of love. It's the gospel of hope, that you could literally march into the enemy's camp and take back what he stole, men and women and children that have gone astray, that are far from God, just like you and I were. And that's why the enemy wants to shipwreck your faith. And if you're not a Christian, right, we know that the Christian life is a battleground, but the unbeliever's life is a playground. The enemy wants to seduce you with all that the world has to offer so that you never wake up realizing, man, I need Jesus. I need hope. I need life. Because when you do that, you become dangerous to the work of the enemy. What's he trying to prevent? You from having a relationship with God. Why? Because if you do, it's pleasing to God. He doesn't want to please God. And if you do, it brings life to you. But so many of us will spend our lives chasing money and career and relationships and things, thinking it's going to make us happy, all to fill that deep, dark void that you and I, if we're honest with, we all have, right? God, right, we've asked this question, God, why, why am I here? What's the purpose of my life? How many of you, and no show of hands, but just think about it, have ever got into the career of your dreams, the relationship of your dreams? You got into it and you're like, it's not all that. It's not what I thought it was going to be. I married a human. I thought she was perfect. I thought he was Mr. Perfect. And in reality, you married a human being who has failed you, who has let you down, and you recognize that nothing you've chased in this life has filled that void that only God can. It's the work of the enemy. He's trying to keep you far from God. Because what is spiritual warfare? We're going to go over that again. Spiritual warfare is the devil's attack on the church to deceive and divide believers. His goal is to lure you into false teaching. His lure is to lure you into sin. His goal is to turn you against God and each other. All this in an attempt to keep you from glorifying God and fulfilling the Great Commission. What is the Great Commission if you're new here today? The Great Commission is the work that Jesus Christ gave the church. It's the answer to your question. What's the purpose of my life? Why am I here? Jesus said, go out to all the earth, to the ends of the earth, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And what do we do when we go out to the ends of the earth? We bring the gospel of good news. Guys, this is the greatest news you've ever heard in your life, right? It's the realization that, man, I can make a decision to become a follower of Jesus. Man, I can't earn it. I can't maintain it. And all I have to do is just choose Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Believe that he's the son of God who died for my sins and rose from the dead. And he takes upon himself all of the guilt, all of the shame, all of my past mistakes. And I go from being someone who is going to hell and now I've been redirected and I'm going on an upward path to heaven. And I'm forgiven. This is great news. This is what the world needs that the enemy is trying to prevent in your life. Look, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what you put your hands to, what plow you do, what your job is. And the truth is we all need to work. You've got to put food on the table. But let me remind you, it cannot be your passion because you have something greater. When we lay on our deathbed at the end of our lives, how many people have you witnessed to? How many people have you shared love with? How many acts of service and, your, and kindness do you have? Your money in your bank account won't save you. Your career, you're not going to think about that when you're like, am I right with God? Where's my family, like, and I wish I would have uh, taken more risks in my life. Those are the top three that people want when they're on their deathbed. Like, that's where we're going to be. So, let, hey, let's not get to that place and have a lifetime of regrets. Let us, as followers of Jesus, make a commitment today to say, God, I want to live every, lot, every day with no regrets. You know what that means? I'm going to leave it all out on the field. If you've ever played sports, right, your coach probably told you that. Get off the bench, leave it all out on the field, and you want to get off of that exhausted. You know how I want to walk into glory? I want to meet Jesus. I want to walk in, and, and he's going to say to me, well done, faithful and good service. I want to walk in exhausted because, Jesus, I left it out on the field for you. And that is the purpose of why you were created. And if you're here and you're like, man, I don't even know what I believe about God, let me tell you God has a purpose for your life. And it's so that you could bring the best message this world has ever heard. And the enemy is, what want, is who wants to get in the way of you fulfilling your purpose and your greatest potential. It's the enemy. So, so here Paul is, he's under house arrest, right? And he's, and he's being watched by Roman guards. And this is a replica of what the Roman guard would have looked like. And if you're here for the first time, we've been talking about, that, about this for the last six weeks or so. 
And, man, he's looking at the Roman armor, and he's u- using it all to illustrate to us biblical truths about spiritual abilities God has given you and I to wage war. You see, God, uh, with God, you can't lose. I don't know what battles you're f- facing today. I don't know where you're at in your life. I don't know where your hardship is, but you can't lose because God is for you right? If God is for you, who could be against you? The truth is you already have the victory. The only place you and I lose, it's right here in our own minds. It's right here. You see, if we allow the enemy to wreak havoc in our minds, where your thoughts are, your actions follow, your actions today become habits, and your habits will dictate where you will be a year or five years down the road. If you want to know where you're going to be, it's almost prophetic. Look at your thoughts today. Look at the people you surround yourself with today. Your behaviors today will dictate where you'll be. So Paul's trying to wake us up to this, Ephesians 6, and we're going to jump right to verse 14. And he says this in light of spiritual warfare. Stand firm then with the belt buckle of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. Guys, this is your wake-up call. And we've worked through each one of these pieces of armor uh, in order in uh, Ephesians 6. And today, we're talking about the helmet of salvation talking about the helmet of salvation. So Paul's sitting there and he's looking at this helmet. And how many of you know what helmets do, right? They protect you. So he's looking at this Roman helmet and, and they all look like this. And they kind of had this mohawk going on. And you know what was really cool about a helmet? It's a covering. It's a covering of protection is what it is. Now the reason why they had this little mohawk is because if you're like me, I don't know how many of you are Italian, I'm Italian, uh, we are vertically challenged by nature. That's just kind of who we are. So the uh, Romans, they actually had this little headdress on which made them seem taller. That's all this headdress was about. It was to make them seem taller and it was to make them unmistakable. When you marched into a town of an opposing enemy or a group and they saw this cool mohawk coming, they were like, oh no, that's Rome. There's no mistaking it. That's Rome and they've been undefeated for over a thousand years. Man, when I see Rome come with that headdress, man, I know that that, that means victory ultimately. So, so that's what this uh, little uh, mohawk represented. They have cheek flaps. They all had cheek flaps. And what was that? It was, to, uh, it was to take away any blows or protect you from any strikes you might have to the side of your head. If you're a boxer or an MMA, you, you realize how easy a knockout is. If you took a fist or a club to the side of your face, you're going down. That's what these bad boys were for. This, this flap on the back This was just in case you turned sideways and a sword came down. So it didn't take your head off. It would actually hit this and deflect down the back of the breastplate. So this helmet was all about protection. It was all about covering. You and I, we use helmets today, right? Today in the military, they still have helmets. Uh, Law enforcement uses helmets. And if you've ridden motorcycles, there are helmet laws in New York State. Why? To To keep what's in your head protected, right? Your brain is actually uh, probably with your heart, your two most sensitive organs. The breastplate protects your heart, your vital organ, from the attacks and arrows of the enemy. This helmet of salvation is meant to protect your mind. You see, but the Roman soldier, when they were not in battle, they would actually keep the helmet right here. There was actually a hook or some sort of device that would uh, weigh on their belt, and it would actually hold the helmet because they didn't need this when they weren't in battle. Truth is, though, if you're a Christian and if you read the Word of God, you recognize that the spiritual battles you and I face, they actually never stop. The enemy is always prowling around. He's always looking for a moment where there's a little bit of a a crack, where there's a little bit of an opening that he can come into your life, and that opening always comes through often invitation, right? We recognize spiritual attacks come through uh, two mechanisms, right? Invitation or invasion. Well, when our thoughts are left open to the enemy, we allow him through, through invitation. And there is a holy helmet law in, in heaven. Do you realize that? Literally, God does not want you to take off your spirit, uh, your, your helmet of salvation. Why? It's to protect your mind. But what does it do first? It does really two, two functional things for us in warfare. One, it's a covering. It reminds you that there is no hope apart from God. There is no forgiveness of your sins. No matter what you've done, where you've been, man, there, there's forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. And this helmet, when you see this spiritually, it's supposed to give you hope. It also puts the devil on notice, the enemy of your soul. 
that what God has done, the enemy cannot take back. Who God has set free, he cannot re-ensnare. The Bible says no one and nothing can take you out of the hand of God. You are his and he is yours. You know what this represents to the enemy? Man, you need to stay back because I'm a son of God. You need to stop attacking my marriage because I'm a son of God. You need to stop attacking my finances. Why? Because I'm not taking this off. And you know what? Though I may struggle, God is still good even when life isn't. And you know what? You can't have my thoughts. You may have my health at times, but you aren't going to have my thoughts. So many of us, man, we take the helmet off and we allow ourselves to be attacked in our mind. And that generally happens, guys, in a couple main ways. One is the thought loop. How many of you know what thought loops are? Thought loops are generally always negative. It's that thing you do that you can't stop doing. It's like that mistake you've done, made in your life. It's like that habit. It's, it's that thing you feel guilt or shame about. And when you're driving and you're on a long ride and your thoughts just start going, you just start thinking about that over and over and over again and you can't stop. It's like that thing that keeps you up late at night and you think about that mistake, that past regret over and over and over in your mind and it's a thought loop. It just never stops. It's cyclical. The enemy wants to bind you up by getting you into thought loops. For some of us, thought loops are what happened to us as children. Maybe somebody touched you in some inappropriate way, and the trauma of that just plays over and over and over again, not in a way of victory, not in a way of I know God has redeemed this, not in a way that I'm safe today, and you know what, God is my protector, but in a way where we go back to that trauma, and it's like we relive it over and over again. That's a thought loop. That's what the enemy desires because when you're stuck in a loop and you feel like you can't get out, you live like a prisoner. You feel like a prisoner. You may be set free. You may be a child of God, but that thought loop imprisons us. The second way when we take off our helmet of salvation is is narrative building, and we all write narratives. Some of us are really good storytellers, okay? Here's what this looks like. Somebody you're working with, a colleague, a friend, a family member, they do something that hurt you. It was offensive. We don't know why they did it. We have no clue. But what do we do? I bet you he or she said that because dot, 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 dot. We fill in the blanks. And we start to assume their motives. We start to make assumptions about their behavior. We start to attribute, and it's never anything positive, isn't it? Oh, you know what? He treated me bad because he had a really big bad morning, and there was a diagnosis given, and he's really struggling. Man, I'm going to pray for him. No, it's always something negative, right? It's never potentially something that could release them that's positive or some positive excuse. It's always, always something negative. And you know what that's called? It's actually gossip, which is a sin. You know where gossip starts? It starts in your mind and heart first before it comes out of your mouth. You see, when you go to somebody and you start talking bad about the other person, it started here and here first, and you've gossiped enough to yourself that you just can't hold it in anymore. And then you start sharing it. And that cancer of narrative writing starts impacting and affecting everybody else in your life. And do you ever get in a moment where somebody told you something horrible about someone else, which was based on assumption, and then you got offended toward them? I can't believe he did that to you. I can't believe she said that to you. And then all of a sudden, you're like, oh, I don't, she just walked in the room. I don't want to talk to her. And she comes up on Facebook, and you swipe fast. And I won't like things anymore because I know what she did to her. Narrative building always ends up into gossip. The enemy wants nothing more than to jam you up with that. You know why? Because when we depart from righteousness, holiness, we walk out of the covering of protection, and we are fully and completely at the enemy's disposal. The third way, there's two more, and you can go to your, uh, your notes and your app if you guys want to see this, is fantasy feeding. How many of you feed your fantasies? Now, I'm going to give you one that happened recently. Sometimes fantasy feeding is really, really bad. Sometimes it feels really good, but the outcome is always really bad. Uh, This week, uh, my daughter was sharing with me, um, she was driving to work and she got caught in a fantasy. She started thinking about what would happen if my dad passed away. You ever been there? Start thinking about that. If my wife passed away, my husband passed away, my kids, now they're totally fine and healthy, but we start thinking of that anyway. And you start feeding that fantasy. She's walking down the aisle. She's not even in a relationship. She's walking down the aisle getting married and I wasn't there and she's crying. She's fantasy feeding. So that's where it looks negative. For some of us, we start looking at the grass on the other side of the fence, and we're like, oh, his grass is greener than mine. We're on Facebook, Instagram, we're like, oh, they're on vacation again. Oh, they're eating at that great restaurant again. Man, I want their life. And you know what? All of a sudden, when we start to, the, 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 the maturity of fantasy feeding, all of a sudden we start to realize, man, I, I actually don't like my life anymore. I'm not happy. I need a change. Something's got to give in my life. And what happens when we fantasy feed? It's because we do not live in a season or a state of gratitude. 
You know what happens when we fantasy, fantasy feed? Your life will never be good enough because the quickest way for you to kill something is to compare it. And that's what fantasy feeding always does. We compare what we have that God has entrusted to you to be a good steward with. We've actually compared it to something else, someone's something else, and that's not good enough anymore. And we're completely dissatisfied with life. And that's what happens with fantasy feeding. But how you protect yourself from fantasy feeding is gratitude. I refuse to get over on this side of the, the fence and look at that grass. God, I'm thankful for what I have. I'm thankful for my health. I'm thankful for my house. I'm thankful for my apartment. I'm thankful for my car. I'm thankful for my wife, my kids, my relationships. But when you start looking at everybody else's stuff, you stop being thankful for what you have. And you know what? When it really matures long term, you start to de despise God. All of these, when they mature long-term, you despise God. And this is why. God, you were supposed to protect me, but you gave more to them than you gave to me. That's the maturity of it. That's the maturity of that sin. But where does it start? It starts when you take off the helmet of salvation. Because when we take off the helmet of salvation, what's the first thing it does? It reminds us of our identity. You know what business the enemy's into? Man, he, he wants to steal your identity. It's about identity theft. When you take off the helmet of salvation and this headdress isn't there, you forget who you are. You look in the mirror, all as you see is you. But when you and I as believers look in the mirror, we should see the life of Christ. I don't know about you, but when I read the word, it tells me that I'm a new creation in Christ. I am made new. Romans 12 tells me I'm a living sacrifice. The old is gone, the new has come. Man, I ain't looking at me and I don't want the devil looking at me because I have nothing to offer. But Christ in me, oh man, you're fighting the wrong battle, devil. That's the reality. And the last one is negative filters. We develop negative filters. And if you're a person who's got the woe is me, your attitude, or glasses half full, or you see the wrong in everything, it's really not you, it's how you've been trained. You see, it all started with a temptation to see something is not good enough. Something is not measuring up enough. And when you feed that thought over and over and over again, what does it do in your brain? It actually creates neural pathways, which changes the way your brain thinks. And you know what? It's not that you're a negative person, you're afraid. And you're trying to protect yourself. So why am I always thinking negative? Because I don't want to get excited about nothing. Because when it's taken away from me, I don't want to deal with that pain. I don't want to get excited about this relationship because when he or she stabs me in the back, I've lost a friend. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to be like a porcupine and I'm going to keep everything at bay. I'm going to see everything as negative so I never need to be let down. What you don't realize is you're cursing yourself. Because there's wonderful seasons, right? Life is the rain and sunshine, beauty and pain. And you know what? When we live with a negative filter, you live life in falsehood, as if it's all pain. But it's not. But if the devil can cause you, tempt you into taking on those thought patterns, you take this baby off, man, your whole life is going to feel pretty negative. It's negative filters. Negative filters. So, so the helmet does a very important second thing for you and I protects you from attacks. You see, when you keep it on, it protects you from attacks of the enemy, and it's a covering that reminds me who I am. You see, every time I don't feel like I'm good enough, man, I put this helmet on, and I'm reminded I am more than enough in Christ Jesus. Whenever I feel like I'm not going to make it, or I can't get through this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, when I feel unloved, I recognize, man, I'm incredibly loved by God unconditionally. When I feel full of guilt and shame of my past that God forgave me, I recognize, man, I am completely forgiven. When I feel like, man, I'm struggling in any area you are, maybe it's relationships, I recognize, man, I am not a slave to bad behaviors. God has gifted me with self-control. Man, I can choose not to act the way I used to act. Man, sometimes we feel insignificant. Man, I am chosen by God. If you've ever felt that way in your life, you are not a mistake. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. God created you. God intended you. You are nobody's accident. You see, but you only, you only know that truth. You only live in that comfort when you don't take off the helmet of your salvation because it reminds you of who you are. Man, when my kids were growing up, and I don't say it as much anymore, and I probably need to, but the moment I share this with you guys, I know they're going to smile. You see, when they were little and they were going to school, my wife and I would always ask two questions. I'd say to my, my kid, maybe it was Kayla, I'd say, Kayla, remember who you are and who you belong to. So I always used to say that before they go to school. Why? Because you're a palazzo. That was the answer to question number one. Remember who you are. I'm, an, I'm a palazzo. And what does it mean to be a palazzo? 
I care about character, my character. I care about my integrity. As a palazzo, I don't settle for less. I'm not going to treat people the way other people treat that person. I'm not going to allow people to mistreat me. Why? Because I'm a palazzo, because I'm worth something, because I'm valuable. Second question, remember who you belong to. Man, I'm a child of God, and I am who God says I am. I'm not who you say I am, and as a child of God, I'm going to live for holiness and righteousness, and when I make a mistake and fall down, you are not going to accuse me, Satan. I may have made a mistake, but God forgives me. He died for my sins. Remember who you are and who you belong to, and that only happens if you leave this on. If we take this off, guys, we're completely lost because those arrows and those attacks will come over and over and over again in your life. And you know what? Paul had the same concerns. He's, he's literally the spiritual father of a young man named Timothy, which was a church planter. And this guy was young. He was actually uh, a mixed race. His mother uh, was Jewish. His father was Greek. And he was kind of torn between two worlds, and he became a follower of Jesus, but he was young. And, and Paul poured into his life. Paul sets him up as a church planter. And this young man faced a battle. He never felt like he was good enough. He felt like he didn't measure up. He felt like he was younger than everybody else. And this is a time in history and culture, which we should still be in, where we honor our elders. And the older you are, the assumption is the more wisdom you have. And Paul trusted this young man and put him in a position of authority. And with great tears, Timothy, man, wore the weight of that battle, of that mantle of leadership and authority. And he would falter often into his emotions. And Paul spoke quite a bit of truth into Timothy's life to remind him to wear this helmet of salvation. But you know what? Timothy lived in a context where there was a lot of fighting going on. Scripture calls it quarreling. There was a lot of debate over what truth is, what truth isn't. There were social justice issues happening in his day and age. Guys, slavery today is still happening. Over 25 million people today are in human trafficking alone. There's slavery rampant throughout the Middle East, throughout Africa, even in China and some Asian countries. Like, that's still happening today. Racism is not new. Here Timothy is, a man torn between two worlds. And Jews did not hang out or socialize with non-Jews. It was racism. There was mass poverty. Like, all the issues that drive you today, that, that you're passionate about, were happening in this day and age. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 5, I'm just going to put this down, this baby's heavy. All right, so, so Paul opens up, he says, join me in suffering, right, like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive a victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. I want to read that one piece one more time. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs. My God, what are civilian affairs? Guys, this truth, this biblical truth, this bombshell, it literally saved me this political season and in this time of uncertain, so many of us, right, confusion about vaccinations. You know what? I had a lot of thoughts and opinions about politics. I do. And you guys saw me post none of that on social media, as well as many of the leaders in our church, if not all of them. Man, I had a lot of thoughts and opinions on who I wanted to win or not win. Lots of thoughts and opinions, but you saw me post none of that. Why? Because I trust the sovereignty of God. That there is no person in a position of authority except appointed by God, part of his sovereign plan or his allowance. And, who, and let, me, let me just preface it with this. What you want to solve here on earth, it's unsolvable and unwinnable. That's, that's the hard truth we have to accept. And let me tell you why. Let's take racism, for example. We are an incredibly multicultural church. I have a multicultural family. We are a... Uh, uh, Mixed family, right? My wife's Asian. I forget, what is it called? It's not a uh, blended family. Oh my gosh. Anyway, you all know what I'm talking about. My wife's Asian, I'm Caucasian, right? And uh, you know what? Racism, it, it's horrible. We, we hate it. It's a sin. It, racism is authored by the devil. It's a work of the devil to separate and divide. And sadly, here's the truth that none of us really uh, want to sit with, is that it actually is in the church as well. By God's grace, not in this church. But it is in, it's in the body of Christ. But, but here's a problem with racism. Here's a problem with abortion or even human trafficking. The church should make statements about that. The church should take a stand. The church should fight the battle because, hey, you know what? You, you know what else is authored by the devil? Favoritism and partiality. We are all made equal at the foot of the cross. But, but you know what the problem with some social justice is? Here's the truth. It's not solvable in this life. Even Jesus himself did not heal every person or solve every issue. Why? Because it's a work of the devil. And who has control over this world? Who's in authority? Satan himself, the Bible says. 
And although the church should be passionate about it, and the church should fight that battle, we also have to have healthy expectations. We cannot solve these social justice issues right now. They will be solved at judgment. When the enemy, when all demonic forces were all evil and all sin, human trafficking, slavery, whatever that thing we stand against is, partiality, favoritism, lying, stealing, theft, all of that stuff, sexual immorality, it will all be judged. At that time, it will come to an end. But there is a battle today that Jesus cared about, and this is why, why that's important for us to have healthy expectations. Th- this is why. Because here we are, without Jesus, our best attempt at human righteousness is solely, follow my words here, because I don't want anybody taking this out of context, it's solely a social justice issue. And what we have is a righteous response to sin, and we want to fight against that. The problem is, it's sinners fighting against sinners. Many of us have racist people in our family. They are the problem. We don't like racism, but there's also problems in us. We are the problem. And that's why it's not achievable. Fully and completely. Don't misunderstand me. I'm going to be clear again. The church should take the stand. The church should fight the battle of those who need a voice, who those who need to be uh, stand up for them because it's love. Love requires it. However, what is our true battle? Salvation. There's one thing in this life that can be won before judgment, and it's the salvation and the soul of each one of you, including myself and every person you and I pray for. You see, the enemy took all human beings into bondage, sin and death. They, we are slaves to sin. Everyone without Christ is going to hell. That's the truth. And you and I, and you know what? I know this is a hard truth, but we have to own it because it's the only way we're going to live spiritually healthy. And you and I have a job to do, to go into the devil's camp and take back what he stole. That's our battle. And when you deposit the seed of truth, they get saved. When they get saved, they come to know Jesus. Their future is eternity with you and God in heaven, and then the heart starts to change. You know what the answer to racism is? Jesus. You know what the answer to lying and adultery is? Jesus. You see, unless the heart changes and righteousness, which does not originate in us, comes in, there is no hope of change. In order for me to be able to step out of my comfort zone and to love the way Christ wants me to love, Jesus has to enter into my life. And that's where it starts. That's the answer to all of these things. Otherwise, you know what, ha- what happens? One group stands against another group that they've demonized, who then stands against them, and it's people that really, in, in their heart, their sin against sin, it, it's completely unsolvable. This truth, a soldier does not get wrapped up into civilian affairs, save me from all of that. And what am I committed to? I'm committed to the gospel. I'm committed to each and every one of you. I'm committed to talking more about Jesus than Joe Biden or Donald Trump. I am, this whole political season. I will stand against racism and human trafficking, and I will pray. But you know what? I understand. I can't change the world out there. Neither can you completely. You can change the world in here. You could be the change you want to see. Stop waiting for someone else to be that change, and you need to sign up and say, I'm a soldier of God. I'm going to love and love completely without limit, no matter who you are or where you've come from. This is how a church gets healthy. We understand what our battle truly is. There is no divide or difference between you and I just because of the color of our skin or the mistakes you've made in your past. Look, anything you've done, I've done. When Jesus met me, I was smoking pot every day, okay? I was living on the streets, living a street life. Then I met Jesus and I'm saved. Do you hold that against me? No, why? Because you recognize me. He's a child of God. My wife got pregnant before we were married. I've been dating her since eighth grade. And you know what? She got pregnant, we got married, and then we met Jesus. And you know what? Our past was erased. That is the unity that can only be had in Christ. You you know what the answer to the world's problems are out there? That answer has to happen first in the church. When we start caring about and loving people's souls enough to realize, I'm not going to worry myself about those battles. I'm going to worry myself about Jesus and what he's called me to do. People start getting saved, and then the only one who can change a heart actually changes the heart. Otherwise, that's what cancel culture is all about, isn't it? Well, you don't like what, I don't like what you're saying, so I'm going to cancel you. And then when we cancel them, they cancel us. And then they cancel them, and they cancel them. It's our best attempt at righteousness. But the reality is there is no righteousness in this land apart from Christ. The second thing it saves me from today is vaccines. Look, I'm going to tell you guys, if you so feel moved to get a vaccine, go ahead and do it. Follow your convinc- uh, convictions. Talk to your doctor about it. However, I have confused feelings about it. And many of you know I was vaccinated, but I still struggle with confused feelings, but I'm not going to talk about that. Why? 
because there's something more important to talk about. What I need to know is if I walk out of here or you walk out of here and somebody gets hit by a bus and they don't make it till tomorrow, I need to know that you've heard the gospel and that you had an opportunity to make the most important choice of your life that will dictate your, your eternity. You see, a soldier of Christ doesn't get involved in civilian affairs. L let me say it this way to you. The church, we just need to have healthy expectations of how much involvement. And, and here's the truth. It, your passion has to be the gospel. The only work God has actually entrusted to you. However, we should stand with the oppressed, the voiceless. We should take a stand because love requires it. It's a Christian duty. And we should stand for every social justice cause that is biblically based. Everyone that's biblically based, we should stand for. And there are some that are not biblically based. And you know what? How we make the decision on that? The Bible is my filter, not my wants, my desires, or my preferences. The truth of God. And it saves you. Man, I, I saw so many of our brothers and sisters really go down with stress and anxiety this last political season because they were fighting so hard for what they wanted. Imagine if we would have just put that on the shelf and trusted God with that and said, you know what, God, I'm just going to focus myself with what's most important. I'm not going to get distracted, God. Scripture goes on, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. Notice what he said. So, so Paul told him, be a good soldier. Don't get distracted. Then he said, your job as a leader is to remind everyone else. Look, I don't know how it's sitting or how it landed, what I just shared with you. If I've offended you, I'm sorry. Know my heart. I, I care about your soul more than I care about your feelings. That's the truth because I, love requires it. And because somebody cared about me enough to be honest. And it's hard and it's scary to be honest, but it has the power to set us free. And then he said to Timothy, as scared as you are, you need to be bold, and you need to share this truth with others so that they don't get distracted. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. This fighting, this quarreling, these distractions, it will ruin you. It will ruin every one of you. Scripture goes on. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. What is the outcome of fighting the wrong battles? You will find yourself far from God at some point, and your agenda is no longer lined up with his agenda. And then the question is, who, who are we serving as people? 2 Timothy verse 22, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Let's just stop there. Every social justice that's biblically based that you and I can think of, if we responded with love, joy, peace, faith, would it not solve every social justice issue in your life? If that was the outcome, if that's what our focus was, the gospel of truth, and our response to everyone's need was love, that means I'm sacrificing me for your benefit. That's how we change the world, church. That's how you change your life. It's by keeping your focus first. When we lose our focus, we lose our way every single time. Don't have anything to do with foolish, stupid arguments. Because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. And the question that I sit here and ask is, how in the world, as it says in Romans, don't be polluted by the things of this world? I'm not a citizen of this world. I'm a citizen of a greater kingdom. But how? When life is hard. How when I'm being bombarded by social media, with the news, and man, there's all of these distractions in your life. Guys, we're without excuse. That's, that's the truth. Paul was without excuse. And some of us believe that if I just follow Jesus, if I become a follower of Jesus, my life is going to be great. Whoever told you that lied to you. Paul's life sucked. That's the truth. It was completely sucky. Okay? And this is why. Because of what Paul went through. And you know what? We all have a cross to bear. Not all of us, not all of us are, are, are born with the same opportunities. Let's, let's own that. Some of us are more privileged than others. We are all privileged because we live in the U.S., but some were born with a spoon of gold, others with silver, and others made of plastic. What do you do with that? Paul's life, right now he's eating plastic. 2 uh, Corinthians 11, 23 to 29 is just a small picture of what Paul went through and the secret to what kept him from being distracted. And it's important that we read this, and this is why. Because it's going to help you to understand no, that life will throw things at you. Life is going to be hard at times. The enemy is going to do whatever he can to distract you. And when it comes, there's only one thing that keeps that helmet on your head. There's only one thing that keeps you from getting lost. Read with me. 
Verse 22. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 23. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I have received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I have been beaten with rods. Once I have been pelted with stones. The guy was stoned, right? Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day on open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles. This is exhausting. Oh, man. In danger in the city, in danger from, uh, in the country, uh, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily pressures of my concern. He was literally concerned for his life every single day. For all the churches. Who is weak? Do I not feel weak? Who is led into sin? Do I not burn inwardly? You see, what Paul is saying is wherever, wherever you're going, whatever you've been through, whatever your hardship is, been there, done that. You think you're suffering? I've suffered too. That doesn't minimize your suffering. That's not what Paul is trying to teach here. He's building us up here to a truth of not getting distracted. And this is what he says. I endure everything. I go through all of this. I go through every hardship in my life. I endure all these things that the enemy throws at me, that the world throws at me, that evil people throw at me, that racists throw at me, that people who just want my money throw at me, everyone who wants to stab me in the back. I endure all of that for the sake of the elect. that they too may obtain salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. What, what Paul is saying here is no matter what life's throwing at me, one thing keeps me on the straight and narrow, my job. You see, as a Christian, you got to know who you are, you got to know who you belong to, and you got to know what you're called to. You see, knowing who you belong to gives you security. Man, I wear this helmet and I am secure in Christ Jesus. My past no longer has a hold on me. The things I've done no longer are upon me. I don't have guilt and shame anymore. I am set free. Who Jesus set free is free indeed. When the devil comes to attack your identity, Satan, get behind me. You have no power over me. I'm a son of God. You are a daughter of God. And you know what? The enemy, his talents, he's got to let you go. He can't have you. And you know what this helmet does? It reminds me to stay focused. Because when I look in the mirror and I see this, it reminds me that I have one job to do in this life. God has called me to bring the good news. There are people perishing. There are people dying. What we think the issue is, is not really the issue. Don't go chasing your happiness. You ain't never going to find it. Don't go trying to solve this issue or that issue because at the end of it, what you're going to find is you can't ever solve it fully and completely because you're not perfect. But there is one who's perfect. There is one who's the answer to all your prayers, all your needs, all your wants, all your hopes, and his name is Jesus. And can I share him with you for a moment? Because he will save your soul. He will bring purpose to your life. He will, man, he will answer every question you ever had about your purpose, your worth, your value, why you're here on earth. Thank God for the helmet of salvation, right? keeps us from getting distracted in a world that wants nothing more than to distract you. So many of us settle for good at the expense of greatness. Church, fight the right battles. Stand for the right biblical causes. But remember this, all the things we get upset about out there, they're going to get dealt with. God is faithful and just. He's going to do that on judgment day. But right now he's given you and I a job to do. That is not, it cannot wait for judgment day because if we get there and don't do our job, church, it's too late. That person that you've been praying for if they never get the gospel message and they get to judgment day, justice will be served. But if you give them the gospel, share with them that message online, invite them to church service, and they give their life to Jesus, and they experience the weight that comes off of their shoulders and all of their joy and all of their hope that they've been searching their whole life for, they finally find in Christ Jesus. Then and only then does their heart change and the world starts to change. Church, you are God's plan A to reach the world. That's what this is about. Are you God's plan A? There is no plan B. God called you. Do you have any idea how important you are? Live like a soldier. We have to stop living like we're weak. We have to stop living like there's not a battle to, to, to fight. There is, and it's going to be won because if Jesus is for you, who can be against you? You can't lose. 
Hey, what's up? My name is Armando. I'm the pastor of Fusion Church, and we are so excited that you followed along in this message. We hope that you enjoyed this message. If you did, make sure that you hit the like and subscribe button down below. If you feel led by God to support the ministry of Fusion Church, you can do that in a number of ways. Number one, pray for us, pray with us. God is doing some great things here at Fusion Church, and that is probably the best way for you to be part of it. The second way is if you live locally, please come out and visit us. Come, uh, come and enjoy service with us. And if you feel led to, you can even join our team and become a teammate. And the third way is if you feel led by God to give to the ministry of Fusion Church, you can do so by going to our website, www.fusionchurchny.com and hit the giving tab. With that being said, guys, God bless you. Hope you enjoy the next message.